Hi, today I'd like to do a code walkthrough of one of the examples on the D3 Data Driven Documents website. If you've not come across code walkthroughs before, uh, essentially all I'll do is briefly, in this case, step through um, the code line by line and try to describe what's going on. So the first one I'd like to try is the panable chart. So if you go on to the D3JS website and go up to examples, you'll be taken off to um, the Observable HQ website where um, various examples are hosted. So the first one here, this um, panable chart, is an area chart um, that shows, I believe it's the price of Apple stock over time from May 2007 to 2012. And as you can see, I'm using this kind of control at the bottom to pan left and right. Um, and where I can see the graph kind of go up and down over time. And on the left, yeah, we have a, um, a number of ticks with uh, price labels, so dollars, price in dollars. And at the bottom we get months, and every now and again interspersed, we have the year. Now, the first thing I noticed about this um, example is kind of looking through the code here. What tends to happen in, in you know, any, any D3 visualization or um, drawing with D3 is we're usually just adding one SVG or canvas element and then we're drawing onto that. What's happening here, in fact, the first thing I noticed about this is that there are two SVGs added to this uh, uh, to, to make up this document and its controls. So um, what I would like to do is just identify these two SVGs to start with, and then we'll look at the code. So the, uh, if I go up here and inspect um, and hone in on the couple of the main elements um, that make up this uh, this chart. So if you look over here, there's two SVGs, uh, one that's enveloped inside a div element and, and one that's outside. Um, they're both seem to kind of fill the space. Now, the first thing to notice is there's one that has a height of, uh, sorry, they both have the same height, but the width on one is uh, substantially larger than the other. Um, so as you can probably guess, this is the width of the um, the full area chart where the the kind of bar bars, I suppose, I guess they are um, subsequent bars that you could say for indicating the prices that they're drawn inside this SVG. Um, the other one that seems to take up um, the whole width is actually just displaying the, the labels of the, the y-axis. So in here in the group, you can see there's um, grouped inside here, there's the, uh, what D3 calls the kind of ticks, which are, you know, zero, they have a label, a line to indicate, um, to help you sort of uh, draw your eye across where the um, where the individual lines going to meet the the label um, and help you read the graph a bit better. And then you have this big one, which includes um, so there's a group at the bottom, which is um, like the y-axis as, as a group for the x-axis, so the kind of horizontal um, path that's got the dates below. Um, and then there is um, a path that has a um, D or sort of a description of the of the area uh, of the area chart. So, why where does this scroll bar come from? Well, this actually comes from um, is the result of setting an um, CSS property on the containing um, div element. Now the reason we get a, li a little scroll bar here is um, is down to the fact that we've a, well we've set up this property and two um, uh, and b that we have um, 
an element inside of it that is much wider than the, the div itself. So the div will only kind of run to 100% um, of whatever it's contained in. But the width of the SVG inside of it is much, much larger. And because we've got the scroll element, we, um, sorry, scroll property, we get the control. If I check this off, then actually it's gone. There's no, no more ability to scroll there. And it seems to have just jumped back to the very beginning. So um, the other thing to note about this is um, this has nothing to do with uh, D3JS at all. Right, this is uh, this is CSS, um, and would work for any other HTML element. So if I take, if I let's say, um, inspect this H1 element, and I reduce the width of it um, to 100 pixels, and I make sure that um, to clip the content, if it oh, clip means kind of hide any content that um, would spill over the, the width, the natural width and height of the element. Um, so the content within there, um, you see it's trying to do some word wrapping, but it can't quite, it's not going to wrap the letters of the word Hannibal. Um, so instead of that, what we can do is we can tell it, just like we have with our chart here, to scroll. So we can scroll left and right and we can read the rest of the word. Absolutely nothing to do with um, JavaScript or D3. Um, if you can do this, um, I think this is actually a quite useful way of um, um, adding controls to your uh, your visualizations because um, controls are added by you know, the the browser's kind of built-in functionality to read CSS or read a piece of HTML is going to be um, far more smooth and faster, especially if you're dealing with uh, large large data sets, right? So um, if you imagine that you're handling all sorts of events and you're writing JavaScript to um, manage controls and filters, actually the uh, built-in um, controls, this, for example, the scroll in this case uh, with CSS, are far more resource light and are far less resource intensive way of, of, of adding some kind of interactivity to your own charts. Um, so not everything can be achieved by using a bit of CSS, but if you can, great. Anyway, um, next I'd quite like to, let's have a look at the code. So uh, I'm gonna shut off inspector here and scroll down and take a look at how this works. Um, now, if you're not used to observable, um, what you see here might seem um, a little bit back to front. So if I scroll to the bottom, you'll find that uh, the basically the last line here, we've got the, the require for D3 at six, which means um, port uh, the D3 library. I mean, if you were writing kind of in, uh, JavaScript and embedded in a web page, you this is the first thing that you would do. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to. You would sort of be met with errors as uh, as a browser goes line by line and tries to run things from top to bottom. Observable doesn't quite work like that. In fact, um, Observable has. Um, uh, has a has a different sort of way of operating in that uh, each individual cell is is run can be run individually and can reference other cells a little bit like you might do with spreadsheets. So um, in each uh, how how to maybe kind of maybe read or interpret this is the what's written here on the bottom here is the actual cell the code that we want to run. What you see above is uh, the result of running that. Um, line of code. Um, now in the cells above we use for example D3 um, so we're using one of the D3 library functions a CSV parse to um, open up a CSV file and turn the what is essentially text into an array of arrays and that's got our data there um, but I'm basically kind of referencing uh, what's in here. 
So if I have a, I'm just assigning a variable in here, and if I use it somewhere else, um, it knows to go off and, and look for it. Now, um, apart from the, apart from this and a few other points, um, what the way that you write observable code is not so different from from JavaScript. So there are a couple of points that um, you should sort of familiarize yourself with, and then. Um, you should be able to get a handle on, on all the other examples out there. Um, later on in this episode, I'll go and add a link to, um, or I'll point out one of the blog posts that describes a lot of these, um, a lot of these uh, kind of idiosyncrasies of, of syntax and observable. So anyway, as I was saying, we, we start off by um, or let's start from the bottom actually and work our way upwards. So D3, we've got D3 library. Okay, that's probably um, something we can take for granted. Um, the next thing that we're doing is um, assigning um, our data. And in fact, we can interact with uh, the output of that cell. We can have a look at what's in here. Um, we've got an array of objects with a date and a value. Um, so we're achieving that using CSV parse, opening up a file, and then using map. Um, so map is a way of uh, literating through an array and building up a new array by um, picking out what you um, what you're interested in, as as it were. So um, for every element in the array, we're going to run a function, and whatever we um, decide to do with that function, whatever we return, will become um, a new element in in a new array. So this is a result of gathering the data there. The next thing that we do is we define a, the, the area function. So this is the function that will um, essentially come up with the description of the for the path element. The path SVG element has the D attribute, which kind of describes the shape um, that becomes um, the kind of blue up and down lines that we uh, we see in the visualization. Um, now this actually references x, y, x and y functions that we define above. So let's have a look at them. So the x and y functions here are um, what are called uh, scale functions in, in D3. So um, Essentially what these do is they take uh, our way of translating um, a value, a data value. So in this case, it might be $500 and deciding that $500 is you know, um, 400 pixels uh, high in as a Y coordinate. Um, and then equivalent for the date value. So we have a date value and we want to put position um, what we're drawing um, so far along the x-axis based on the progression of time. So that's what x and y are doing. x-axis and y-axis um, are then there to define what the, the labels should look like, how far they should be interspersed, um, how we should display the date. So are we going to just add months or are we going to put months and every now and again we're going to put in a year? Um, and how often do we want to add labels to a graph? So that's what x-axis and y-axis do. Um, they're they're both, both functions as well. And then here at the top, we've got height and margin. So we figure out, um, uh, what does it say? Yes, yeah. so we figure out, um, we decide to find some kind of constants for um, the dimensions of our, our, um, our visualization. So we have this big, big cell here um, that is in what Observable calls a, a block. So we've got a lot of um, statements in this uh, in this one cell, and we have to do that by wrapping it in these um, parentheses. Which, if you think about the syntax of a function in JavaScript, that you would have multiple lines written in there. There's another kind of um, <clears throat> observable keyword called yield and um, so this effectively think of this as being um, our keyword that says I want to draw 
uh, what I pass to you here now. Um, so a bit like a kind of return. Um, let's take a look at this. So um, within our block, we start off by figuring out what the minimum x and maximum x values are. Then a, we, um, sorry, these are not, um, forgive me, uh, minimum x value in terms of uh, an actual x coordinate and what's the max x coordinate, right? So uh, we are using, we're calling our scale function, passing in the very first date and passing in the last date to figure out how wide our graph should be, right? So actually, if we used a different data set and we fired in um, a smaller uh, graph, uh, sorry, a smaller range of dates, um, the width of our visualization here will be based on that data. Um, so that's quite useful for reusing this, um, <clears throat> the same, the same code for maybe another um, stock or uh, instead of Apple stock or uh, maybe only Apple stock in the past year or something. Um, <clears throat> So uh, then we add, we create a div element, and then we start to um, create the, the elements and start drawing onto what um, the contents of what we want to show. So the first thing is um, an SVG element. As I mentioned, there's two of them. This first one uh, is all about um, defining the properties and um, the dimensions of really just the 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 y-axis here right so this one gets to um has an absolute um style sheet property and has a z instance of one which means it gets to just sit on top and stay fixed so when we're scrolling back and forward in the chart it stays where it is if we had this a uh, y label in uh, if we have these y labels in the in, along with um, the rest of this chart and um, as we scrolled along it would just scroll out of view so that's why we need to separate it um, what we call body here is actually div element and this is the kind of encapsulating um, element that holds the svg with the actual chart uh, area chart inside of it um, and we're adding overflow x scroll and webkit overflow scrolling and we're setting that to touch. Um, oh, I believe this is so that um, you can scroll on touch screens. Maybe worth double checking that one. Uh, so inside here, we're setting a width, a height. We, yes, we call, uh, we want to um, append a group with the x axis. Um, and then here we go. Here's the actual meat of the operation where we append path. Um, now based on, and we're binding some data to it. Um, and what will happen is the data that we have is going to be um, passed into the area function. And the result of that, um, it will come up with a kind of SVG description um, <clears throat> of, of what the uh, actual path should look like. And that is set in the D attribute. So if you go and inspect an element and you'd like to have a look at that, this big massive long string of um, essentially the kind of coordinates um, and data here is the result of running uh, data, uh, sorry, running area and passing in data to it. Okay. As I mentioned before, there are um, several differences between the way that you would write a visualization and using D3 in normal JavaScript, uh, normal JavaScript land or on a web page versus how you would do it with Observable. Um, this is why I recommend you read a blog post that's hosted on Observable HQ that's called Observable's Not JavaScript. Now you're probably wondering why um, all of the D3JS examples are on Observable HQ, and uh, why the you know it, it, why why do this when the um, why do this when there's so many examples out there and there's kind of history of um, 
other examples and tutorials that um, do not use observable at all. Um, of course, if you want to embed uh, D3 visualizations and use um, the, the output of the visualizations in your own website, then you're going to want to, um, you're not going to want to put it host the notebook and embed a notebook into your, your website. That's quite right. However, Observable is a handy editor for sharing and developing visualizations, particularly down to the kind of nature of um, being able to kind of quickly run cells, quickly change things and see the result of what you're doing. So it closes, it sort of um, shortens the feedback loop of when you're writing code and you get to see the result of what you've done. Um, there are other kind of advantages. I'm not actually a big observable HQ user myself, but I found that um, having a read through this blog post um, in particular looking at the um, a couple of points I mentioned here, cells not running in, in to, uh, run in topological order, that they reference each other. Um, I think maybe one of the other big things um, is the understanding generators and blocks. Um, if you kind of look, go through and look through a couple of uh, these points, um, then you can probably go back to the other examples on, um, on, on the D3JS site and make sense of them fairly quickly without um, really diving in and becoming a big observable uh, user. It doesn't, it won't take that much from you. Anyway, that I hope has been very useful for um, for basically one of the <laughs> first screencasts. So um, if you have any feedback, I would love it. If there, I would love to know if there are any other uh, examples that you would like to um, see a walkthrough or if there are um, ways that I've, I can improve, of course, particularly in terms of whether there is enough detail or um, the things need to be higher level, whether the walkthrough was a bit too slow for you. Um, either way, let me know. Thank you for this and we'll hopefully catch you another time.